Uh, welcome everyone to the World Economic Forum 2019 panel on realizing the data economy. I'm Robert Smith and delighted to be here. Uh, today I think we're going to have a, a fun and dynamic discussion and I'll introduce uh, our panelists in a, in a few minutes. But the, the, the topic was, was brought about by, by a, a, a narrative really that came from Klaus Schwab where he coined this whole phrase of the fourth industrial revolution. It's been about four years since we all started to really understand uh, A, the dynamic and B, understand what the implications are in society, what those implications are for business and, and frankly for all the, the people on the planet in terms of how we are adjusting to this new economy. What Klaus did was he called upon us to, to remind ourselves that you know, all these new technologies that we're embracing, that we're facing, first and for foremost are tools, and they're tools made by people. Uh, we know this fourth industrial revolution has uh, staggering promise, and frankly, for the first time in history, opportunity and wealth can be created through the power of one's creative mind and leveraging vast amounts of computing power, thank you, Andy, for that, uh, to turn great ideas into products and services and make our lives better. Intell intellectual capital has become the new currency of business and finance and the promise of utilizing brain power to move individuals, families, and entire communities from poverty to prosperity within one generation has never been more possible than it is today. And yet, there's this pervasive sense that technology is driving people rather than people driving technology. And if one thing has changed over the last four years, it's the speed at which change is happening. It's exponential and it's accelerating. In fact, a few facts to consider. More data has been generated in the last four years than in the previous combined history of man. Over since 2020, smart sensors, or by 2020, smart sensors and Internet of Things devices will generate over 500 zettabytes of data. And the investment in artificial intelligence is accelerating to pace at hundreds of percents per year and potentially will increase over $50 billion of annual spend. Facts like these, frankly, strain the brain's processing capacity and they can become desensitizing. And if we're not vigilant, disempowering. But as ubiquitous as technology is in our da daily lives, let's not forget that we're still in the early chapters of this data economy. And so they're bound to mis missteps and course corrections. The way I like to think about it, any new technology, there's a point of euphoria and excitement. And then there's a point of worry and then we have to figure out how to make rules. And I think we are somewhere in that narrative and somewhere in that time frame, and we have to figure out as an industry, as a society, how we're going to embrace and balance this, these enormous societal and economic benefits with the need for privacy and protection. And it's not gonna be easy, but we have to take this challenge on head on. Tim Cook wrote a wonderful article in Time Magazine is basically saying this challenge of data privacy is solvable. It isn't too big, too challenging, and most importantly, too late. And so part of what we have to do is embrace this in a way so that we can have a common destiny that is empowering and people-powered and people-centric in this evolution. It's not too late to harness data as a catalyst for innovation and empowerment while ensuring that privacy and personal agency isn't sacrificed in the process. And like I said, this won't be easy. But I feel confident, especially with these folks sitting to my left, that we'll be able to handle a lot of these challenges together as business people, as academics, and frankly, as policymakers. So let me first introduce them. I have Brian Dupereau on my left. He's the CEO of AIG. Brian's an iconic CEO from the insurance industry, that, an, an industry that's always been powered by data. By, by data. That's what we should put down. Oh, yeah, powered by data. <laughs> Brian's known for saying his job is to run towards risk and give others the opportunity to embrace the opportunity to build their businesses and enhance entrepreneurs' success. Right. To his left, left is Andy Jassy, who's the founder and CEO of Amazon Web Services, the largest cloud platform. They serve every imaginable business segment in a meaningful way, and they've transformed cloud services from being a utility to frankly becoming the foundation of our economy. Andy understands the unique challenges and opportunities of gathering, analyzing, and utilizing data for the common good. And to his last left is Joanna Bryson, who's an associate professor in the Department of Computing at the University of Bath. She has devoted her illustrious academic career to exploring artificial intelligence and the ethical implications of the growing use of artificial intelligence and the impact of technology on economies and humans. So our goal, over the next 40 minutes, and then we'll give you a chance for, for questions, is to capture 
what is unique about this moment in time. We'll discuss what is possible now, now that has never been possible before, and frankly, what are the resulting issues that arise from our evolving economy. We'll also get a glimpse into the future, hear about some of the cool stuff you are seeing and working on, and frankly, think about what are the pathways that we need to take so that the data doesn't rule us and we continue to command the use of it to make a better society for all of us. So without further delay, let's dive in. And Brian, I want to start with you. You're in the middle of a pretty dramatic change in the way you're underwriting your business. Yeah. You've been in this industry for quite some time, and we'd love to hear a little bit about how you're utilizing data differently than the way you did 10 years ago and what the implications are for the insurance industry. So, you know, to start with, we're risk takers. So we, we're the other side of this risk management that's going on, mitigating risk. We're the ones who take it, you know, for good or bad. And we devour data. I mean, we just consume data. If we need it. It's our lifeblood because we're using that to divine what this risk is. Uh, what kind of risk are we dealing with? Uh, and in the past, and I started out as an actuary a few years ago now, um, you know, it was very retro. You know, we used to say we're driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror, you know, because we're assuming that the past and the future, they're going to be pretty much the same. But we know today there's so many there's so many bends in this road. You better be looking forward. So so this data thing for us has changed uh, the way we're trying to do this risk analysis, which is to be much more predictive. So that's number one. Number two, the amount of data that's available is just enormous. And so so sorting out then which are the best uh, new data sources that we can use to predict where we're going, you know, now becomes a very interesting task. And I'd say my actual profession is wrestling with that because they've learned data techniques which maybe are like dinosaurs mm -hmm. as opposed to the predictive analytics of the future. So this is, you know, for us, you know, risk is, the, the other interesting thing about it is it's, it's an enabler. I mean, we need this information to make decisions so it makes, us, it makes it easier for us to understand the risk. But as you said, the way the world's changing, the risks we're staring at are so much different than the risks of five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. For instance, this connectedness, I'll just do one example, connectedness, okay? So in, um, in, in petrochemical plants, you would have engineering that would basically go and do their work and understand. Now we have these management systems which will do most of that work kind of on a real-time basis, except they're connected to a whole bunch of other petrochemical plants. So if mm -hmm. they get that one wrong, I, I used to have one isolated incident. Right. I, I may have like a conflagration, you know, it's like having two buildings next to each other. You don't like to do that as a fire insurer. So it's just um, fun, but a uh, wild, wild ride. But for us in the risk business, it's great because there's new risks emerging every day. Mm -hmm. Society needs our help, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a very daunting task to stay up with it. I want to come back to some of that systemic risk a bit later. But Andy, <laughs> let's talk about, you know, years ago, the, the, the whole idea of distributed computing and, and the capacity. It originally, well, you should talk a little bit about what was the original intention and how has that evolved? And, and talk a bit about how you are now thinking about utilizing the vast amounts of data that now exist in your cloud? Well, we, we got started thinking about AWS in part, in significant part, because we were having challenges ourselves inside of Amazon in delivering new capabilities as fast as we wanted. And when we would talk to product development teams, they would say, look, I, I know that the leaders think that these projects should take two to three months end to end, right. but we're spending two to three months just on the database or just mm -hmm. on the storage or just on the compute. And, uh, you know, and everybody, all my peers are doing the same thing. Nothing extends beyond our own projects and we're all reinventing the wheel. And Amazon's a really strong technology company and always has. And we figured that if there was this real thirst inside of Amazon for reliable, scalable, cost-effective infrastructure to allow you to build much more quickly, mm -hmm. that probably other companies had that same interest and demand as well. So that's really what got us started thinking about this. And, 
You know, we launched our business in 2006, and, and at the time, cloud, we didn't even know the term cloud. Right. You know, I mean, we call it Amazon Web Services. <laughs> and, you know, the first use of cloud, for us at least, was our compute services, the Elastic Compute Cloud. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it really was aimed at trying to help small and large companies and governments be able to move much more quickly for mm -hmm. their constituents and customers. And the business started off in the early days um, primarily appealing to startups. And if you look at most of the big startups over the last dozen years, they've built their businesses completely from scratch on top of the cloud. And it's allowed them, you know, in the old days when you had to um, do a startup, you had to raise this capital and you would uh, spend it on data centers and on hardware, and then you get basically one shot to try your idea, and if right. it didn't work, you had to go back and raise again. Mm -hmm. And with the cloud, because you only pay for what you consume, and you don't have to lay out any of the capital for the data centers or the servers, you know, people could try lots of ideas uh, or variations of their ideas for like $30 a month right. and until they got traction. And so this, you know, you see companies like Airbnb and Pinterest and Slack and Domo and Robinhood and Stripe. I mean, all these companies have built their businesses from scratch on top of the cloud and on top of AWS. And then what started happening over the last few years is that large companies and governments started to realize actually it's not just for startups. If mm -hmm. we actually want to invent in a quicker way for our constituents and customers, we can do it so much more quickly on these services and this infrastructure that we don't have to build ourselves. Right. And over time, as that started to grow in the enterprise, what's happened is that companies have realized that if they want to be competitive mm -hmm. uh, and they don't want to fall behind other companies who are employing this technology to move much more quickly, they should be using it as well. So, you know, something that grew just to try and help, you know, started is just trying to help engineers and development teams and companies start to use uh, tools to allow them to build quicker for their customers has over time accumulated, you know, our business is a $27 billion revenue run rate business growing 47% right. year over year. And we're really just in the start of what I would consider the meat of enterprise adoption in the U.S. Outside the U.S., I'd say we're 12 to 36 months behind. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, over time, we've accumulated a, uh, a fair bit of, of, of data that we um, store for our customers. And we, to your question, we don't do anything with that data. That data mm -hmm. is not ours. Mm -hmm. That data is our customers. And our customers get to decide where to put that data. It does not move unless they choose to move it. To us, it just looks like a blob. We don't, we don't have any interaction with it. And we don't look at it. And, for our customers, many of our, our enterprise and government customers where the data really matters to them, um, they encrypt that data. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we're really just a, um, a trusted steward of the data. It's the customer's data and they get to decide what to do with it. Couple questions, one, staggering growth rate. Did you ever imagine or do you all ever imagine it was going to grow this big and be this, in, in this quickly? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think uh, a true story when we were proposing the AWS business at Amazon, and we, we don't do PowerPoints at Amazon, yeah, but we only right. do these six page narratives. And <laughs> we had this board meeting and we presented the narrative and the board read it and, um, you know, first comment was one of our board members said, uh, Andy, you, you're really lucky you work at a company that would consider <laughs> investing in something like this. <laughs> and, uh, and which I agreed with him. <laughs> and, and then the second uh, question was, I noticed there's not a PL and l mm -hmm. in this narrative. Did you just forget <laughs> to include it? And, uh, you know, I tried to explain, as is, as is really true with most new businesses, and I think companies often um, fool themselves into being able to think they can predict what a new business is going to do. Right. You don't know. And there's a few levers that, you know, I, I tried to show that could make it a million dollar business or a billion dollar business, and none of us knew until we tried it because it was a pretty different model. So I don't think, I think we all believed that there was a high need for it mm -hmm. and that it had the chance to be a significant business, but I don't think any of us had the audacity to predict it would grow yeah. this quickly. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to take exception to a couple of things. I think we pay $50 a month, so I'm coming back to you a little bit later <laughs> in, the, in the session about this, this price cut we're about to get. I think academic is 36. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, that's, that's probably what it is. Uh, Joanna, I, I want to talk a bit about what this, this proliferation of data has enabled, especially as it relates to newer technologies and artificial intelligence, and you know, and to, to one, talk a little bit about some of the more interesting utilization of, these, of, of data from an AI perspective, and what challenges you think we face in ensuring that we are, we are handling other people's data properly? Okay, uh, that's a bigger topic. Thank you yeah. again for having me here, um, everybody. Uh, the, People, I mean, artificial intelligence, I, some people are saying artificial intelligence is machine learning and machine learning is data. Mm. That's not true. Right. 
right? Um, machine learning is one of the ways we program artificial intelligence. Nevertheless, why everybody thinks artificial intelligence is here now is because now we can do things like uh, natural language processing, mm -hmm. you know, this, the translation, understanding what you're saying, speaking to you. Um, we can do things like deep fake, which is, you know, you may not only mo know about that for porn, but um, it, it means that we, well, we can do great stuff for lip sync for all of you guys who like to dub your, your uh, television, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also it means that um, we have serious uh, problems for our democracies mm -hmm. that in real time you can fake video uh, to, while people know that their president is speaking, you can show their president showing something else. Okay, so that stuff is amazing and it's human-like. And so all of a sudden we see it and go, "That's really AI because it looks like me." Right. Anyway, the capacity to do those kinds of things. Some people say it's been coming because of smartphones, because suddenly we have so much data about people that we're more able to mock up people. Mm -hmm. But. Artificial intelligence affects every single part of life. I mean, what humans are is like, you know, the most intelligent, the most able to share culture and what we've already figured out, our computation with each other. That's how we're different from all the other primates, mm -hmm. right? So the um, AI affects all of that. And, and, and it's, you know, the, the way the world has changed with, with like search, you know, search engines, it's hard to get our head around the fact that now we can just find things out that we used to have to sit around and debate over dinner and then maybe go to a library right. you know, next month to find <laughs> out, right? The, and it's interesting, uh, you know, you guys are economists and I'm not. I still don't understand uh, why people don't see how that's affected productivity because mm -hmm. there, there's this mystery. I think productivity has some measurement issues because yeah, yeah, it's question. just changed our lives. Massively, yeah. So massively, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we uh, just just to hit pick up on that point. When our, in our companies, when we look at and evaluate it, and literally we have over seven hundred percent ROI from some of these the implications of implementing some of these solutions into our customer base. And it's just yeah. and to your point, it isn't picked up, isn't characterized and understood in, in a lot of the uh, you know economic indicators. Uh, well, going back to the things that could go right and wrong, one of the one of the things that happens, uh, of course, that that we've all talked about. Uh, part of the reason I get invited to this stuff is about. Uh, prejudice. Right. So that uh, if you are training your AI based on data that's derived from humans, mm -hmm. which is where uh, where the smart comes from, like intelligence isn't some magic thing. It's not math. It's something. It's computation. It's figuring out the right thing to do at the right time. And so artificial intelligence is when most of it, some of it is you know actually doing computation with with fantastic tools. Mm -hmm. but a lot of it is uploading what humans have already figured out and what biology has already figured out. Mm -hmm. So if we do that, and that's the only way to get something like language, then we also get all the bad parts of humans along with the good parts. Right. Right. But anyway, one of the things people have done on the other side of that is in HR departments. Uh, they found that when they're going through when you're going through stacks of resumes, do you know the study, the the thing about um, people send out sci evil scientists sent to a lot of companies, yeah. uh, a whole lot of resumes that were fake, and they just changed the name the between names, right. yeah, yeah right. European American yep. names and African American yep. names. The African American CVs, same CV, uh, got 50 percent less in invitations to interview. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that is not explicit racism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was implicit racism. It's, it, it, it lines up with, and our study showed this with AI, it lines up with the implicit biases when you're sitting there flipping through hundreds of CVs. Right. When you got to the table and people were making the shortlist decisions, they, they were able to, be, you know, to value yeah. diversity. Right. Right. But when they're going through fast, they were doing badly. Now people are using AI for that, and exactly. apparently they're getting much better results and being able to do much more diverse. So you can use it to hiring. balance the bias dynamic yeah. that occurs just, just through a quick screening. Right. But going back to our measurement problem, mm -hmm. try to find an HR department that will go on the record with exactly how much better they're doing, because they don't want to admit they had a problem <laughs> right. before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? understood. Yeah. understood. Yeah. Let, let's, you know, one of the things I want to talk about, Andy, if you can first talk about some of the, the, the innovative solutions that you all are bringing in and your customers are now using to drive their industries forward. I mean, you literally have customers in almost every major vertical segment on the planet. And Brian, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the implications in, in insurance, so don't pick the insurance example. But part of it is thinking about the optimism, the, pro the, 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 the promise of data, and using this data economy to, to make life better. I don't know if you have a few examples you'd like to, to talk through. Well, uh, there's just so many examples. I mean, just, just the fact that you can start businesses and go from kind of an idea to an implementation uh, of that idea in several orders of magnitude faster in the cloud because you don't have to provision all the infrastructure or build the services just 
completely changes what's possible. And you see it all over the place. I mean, Netflix built their streaming business right. completely on top of, of AWS. And it's kind of amazing the mm -hmm. growth that they've had over mm -hmm. those 10 years. I mean, it's an incredibly talented team and they're very clever, but um, you just see the, the ability to actually build a whole business. You look at Singapore Post, wanted to build an e-commerce business and uh, it had been different from the rest of their business. And it, you know, they said it would have taken them about 18 months to, and, uh, and a, a large number of people to kind of con you know, consider that business and then build it and launch it. They built it in just a few months on top of AWS. And, and it, you, know, you look at some of the technologies, uh, you know, because the cost of compute, mm -hmm. and the cost of storage have come so significantly down over the last number of years, which is a combination of you know, some cycles of Moore's Law and then some technology advancements in the cloud, you find that um, people are storing so much more data than ever before. And because the cost of bandwidth connectivity has come way down, people are actually then able to kind of leverage uh, uh, that connectivity to do things they couldn't do before. And there's loads of examples. Um, if, if, you look at, um, if you look at John Deere as an example, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, they, they have now um, several hundred thousand telematically enabled tractors that right. is collecting information in real time and uh, taking that data and sending it back to the cloud and doing analytics on what they're learning on the planting conditions and then sending that back down to the planters you know, right. and the farmers right. to actually take action. But that wasn't really something you're going to do before. Or if right. you look at Illumina, who does uh, you know, genome sequencing, they have their um, genome sequencing hardware you know, hooked up to the cloud and AWS to do analytics, to mm -hmm. analyze in, in real time what they may be seeing and trends and things that look like other other types of uh, um, conditions that they've seen in the past. And so you can just see it across every single industry. The, the combination of um, storage being so much less expensive and the right protections and security on right. top of that storage, along with compute being so much less expensive. And then the set of tools that you have available to you now in the cloud with you know, just every imaginable analytics service all kinds of machine learning capabilities, mm -hmm. um, the ability at the edge where you have assets and devices sitting at the edge to take those, the, the data off of those devices and put it in the cloud and take action around them. And increasingly now, you're starting to see combinations of these where um, you have these assets at the edge that are um, sending the data into the cloud and then people have built machine learning models that they've trained in the cloud right. and then are taking the models and effectively putting them on top of the devices so you can do the inference of the prediction right at the edge. Mm -hmm. And so all these things were, were ideas I think people talked a lot about a lot before but then are now becoming reality. Which is interesting, you know, again, to Joanna's point, you know, massive productivity that frankly actually isn't being captured, I think, in any mm -hmm. economic indicators. Um, you know, we're sitting here in Davos over the last few days and I hear everyone trying to talk each other into a recession. <laughs> uh, and but to a great extent, you know, you hear these productivity dynamics in, in industries that, that show that we are actually, you know, innovating, I think, faster mm -hmm. uh, than we ever have. And, and the real question is what's going to be the implication on A, business and B, society. And, you know, Brian, you know, one of the things that we, we talked about was, you know, ownership of data versus ownership of algorithm. Okay, right. who owns what? And in yeah. your industry, and look, I, you know, underwrite a fair amount of insurance, or actually have a fair amount of insurance with, with your company, and the question is, you know, do I, do I own my data? Do you own my data? Yeah. Do you use it? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that dynamic of ownership of data. Well, I, I, I do differentiate, I mean, because people are always talking about, well, disclose, you know, disclose the algorithms, and to me, that intellectual property, the person who de developed it should own it. Mm -hmm. Disclosure shouldn't be required. But this data, I mean, we, I, I have no problem buying data. I mean, it, it, if, if it's part of my, call it manufacturing process, right? I'm, I'm, I'm providing a service, how do I get that? It's like, you know, paying for raw materials or paying for energy or paying for water, you know, paying for data. I, I, I think that's reasonable, um, I really do. And so I think this, this whole question of who owns the data is an important one. And I, I, am, I, I really believe the individual should own their own data. I really yeah. do. I think that's, that's easy, you know? And, you know, if, if it's a, if it's a, a corporation, it's a, it's a different situation. I mean, you, you, you put yourself in the public eye, right? You're, and in, and that, what, that, what comes of that becomes public information. So for instance, um, you know, you're a restaurant and, um, you know, I would say I love, you know, this predictive analytics kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. what we're really trying to find out is, is are they any good? You know, it, it, the management, the quality management, number one question. 
So how do you how do you ever figure that out? You say, well, how long you been in business? Well, that's kind of a dumb question because yeah. right? you still may not be that good. You, right. All you know is if you've been around a while, you must have been better than the other guy. Wasn't. <laughs> right, but right, right. Are you any good? So, but we now are. You know, there's an army of engineers mm -hmm. out there, right, who can't wait to tell you their experience at the restaurant. Right. To me, that's that's a little bit different. So you as a restaurant, that information is out there. Mm -hmm. That's public, and and maybe. Maybe the person who's, who's assembled it says, well, I own that. We can debate that, and would you buy that? But I think the individual, absolutely. But how you use that data, whether we as, as risk takers uh, develop algorithms based on the data that we've acquired, either because it was public source, and there's a lot of that, or we acquired it, I don't care. But once I create that algorithm, that should be mine. And that's, yep. that's kind of how I differentiate the two. I, I want to talk a little bit about you know, this ownership of data, and if that's the case, as an individual, am I entitled to get paid for it? Am, am I entitled to delete it? Am, what are the clearinghouse mechanisms? Right. Now we're getting to the point of how do we create these rules? Right. And you know, how do we govern these rules? And John, I'd lo love to hear some of your thoughts on, on that dynamic. Well, I, I want to back up slightly and, and go back to this, uh, do, your own, do you own your own data? What's going on with that? Um, and how could you get paid for it? How are companies going to be able to do this? So let's talk about uh, not Amazon so much, although I'll come back to a little piece of the, of the, of the um, recommendation system. Mm -hmm. But normally, if you think about uh, free services um, like uh, Facebook and Google, I think the best way to think about that is, in, is information bartering. You know, a lot of people said that, oh, we're being used, you know, we are the product, that kind of thing. No, we're not stupid. We do this because we enjoy the information we get back, right? And, and there's a, so I think there's a bartering that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And actually, part of that bartering, I think, it, like all bartering, is uh, tax evasion. Mm -hmm. So we, I, you know, and at the point of barter, when you get that data and you take it into your company, you don't know what it's worth. It may be years before you see a way to exploit it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that really, if we're going to uh, tackle some of the big problems that we are seeing happen now, like inequality, we have to think about things like shifting our taxing strategy from income taxes towards wealth taxes. So when you increase your wealth mm -hmm. and uh, I know that we all sound like Americans, I apologize for that, but I do actually hold a British passport which I got in order to be an EU citizen, incidentally, because I wanted to live in Austria. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> right. but I, I, I've been a professional uh, in, the UK, in, the, in Europe since uh, 2002, and I've been living here since 1991. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so going back to the, the GDPR kind of perspective on this, whoever holds data about you, and what the GDPR doesn't say that you can't hold data on people, it says that you have to protect, you can't use it in certain kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what Europe has basically decided is that your data is a part of you because it can be used to predict you, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so they've decided it's their job, the, the, the countries of Europe, we've decided it's our job to defend the data of our citizens, right? right? So, that, so the, the big danger of, of data in this sense is the prediction, the capacity mm -hmm. to know and therefore control people. Right. And we could go into some interesting conversations, as other panels have, about how that's been affecting democracy. Yeah, we, we should talk about that. You know, part of it, you know, you think about GDPR violations, like all things when you're establishing new rules. You know, you hear about this, you know, almost $60 million oh, yeah. fine. You know, the, the question, $60 million relative to the size of that company is nothing, right? And so the question oh. is, you know, how do you manage the abuse? And, yeah. you know, and, some, and the next question is, how do you ensure the governments, not companies, governments don't abuse access to this data? to over-police certain populations, to you know, create hardship in certain areas? Those are some of the questions I think I'd love to hear yeah. some thoughts on. I, let, let me come back on that. I forget, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry I dropped that, and then I'll let you guys go. Yeah. I, I, some people say that the, the best economists, I guess, say that the best way to maintain authenticity is that the governments and a large number of medium-sized companies sort of police each other. So when you have uh, really large companies, then you get into some different kinds of uh, dynamics. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting situation right now because I think it would be a mistake to think that one nation state should harness Amazon or Google or Facebook at this point because they are protecting uh, the data of the entire planet. And, and we know that there, you know, there isn't any government you can really trust. Well, OK, maybe it's because I was born in America. No, we should I, talk I about that, that issue of trust in a minute that. for sure. But yeah, please. Yeah, OK. So the, so the point is that um, there are ways to be accountable for these things. And I'm hoping there will be a much larger fine than 65 million on a company that was not accountable for, for its data 
and that uh, you know said that they weren't being careful with the data, mm -hmm. and and that didn't uh, uh, adhere to the norms that other companies were adhering to in terms of who was allowed to have that data. Right. So I'm hoping that we'll make an example of this and we'll start understanding that with AI, as with everything, there's an accountability to the manufacturers to be able to prove due diligence, mm -hmm. to prove that they are keeping adequate track of how they wrote the software, how they tested the software, the providence of the data, not just you know, did you pay for it, but also do you know that somebody didn't hack into it and give you bad data? Right. So you, there's a whole range of things that we can, choose, we can go through and be accountable for. Do you all have thoughts on how we evolve, at least in the U.S.? Let's talk the U.S. for a second. I know California you know, issued some, some data privacy laws for the first state to, to do that. Uh, but what is the dynamic you think that we need to, to adopt in the U.S. to create real meaningful balance, checks and balances type you know, scenarios with companies and governments as, use, as it relates to use of data? Should it be perishable and they can only use it the one time for the use and then it goes away? Or you know, is there some sort of a system we can say, oh, I want to opt in and get paid for it, but what's the price? What's the dynamic that you all think uh, needs to be put in place to create, and Andy, I want to start with you, create some sort of structure and rules-based engine for, for data privacy for the individuals? I don't know. That's a yeah. hard question. Yeah, that's why you're here. I'm glad you went first. <laughs> yeah, you, went uh, you know, um, it, it's just uh, it's so different. You know, that question. It's a super interesting question, and one that I I expect that um, we'll grapple with uh, across lots of dimensions. You know, companies and societies for a long time, and it just turns out in the business that I work on, AWS, that it's just much less applicable because it's not our data. You mm -hmm. know, all that data is our customers' data and our customers get to make those decisions. You know, the one thing I would say is that um, you know, we have a very strong belief, and you know, we, we have, over the time that we've been doing AWS, um, various countries have come out with various laws about um, access to data and you know, uh, how data should be um, governed and managed. And you know, because we operate in so many countries, we will always honor the laws of wherever we're operating, but we have a very strong belief that that data is not the government's. That data are customers and companies, and, and, and their contract and agreement with their end users is what should govern that data, not governments who, for whatever reason, want to have access to that. And, and I also think that as it relates to the U.S., um, I think it would be um, much easier for us to have a coherent and consistent set of guidelines if we come up with guidelines um, across the country as opposed to 50 different states yeah, right. having different guidelines. That will be you know, very messy and very inefficient. And I think that has much higher risk of being applied incorrectly if you have to have 50 different policies. Right, right. Michael, Brian, do you have some thoughts on the dynamic of creating well, policy? I, I, first of all, I agree with Andy. This is hard. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, first of all, I think you gotta, you got to establish who there's got to be some rules around who owns it. Is it property? Is it my property or not? It's property law, right? Mm -hmm. Ownership. Uh, how did it get transferred, right? I mean, we have a lot of, we've got a lot of uh, law over a long period of time on other kinds of property and how, you know, is the provenance of it? Mm -hmm. uh, was it properly transferred? So I think, you, you know, you've got to establish that. I, I got to tell you, so, so now you have this data. What are your obligations right. as a custodian? So you, you say you're not, it's not my data, but you're holding it. So you've got a custodian's responsibility in some way, shape, or form. What is that? Mm -hmm. uh, how onerous will those be? Because we have a lot of bad actors out there who are doing it for a, var a variety of reasons, from, uh, from nation states down to you know, extortionists. And what, you know, what are the standards I will be held to in terms of my ability as a custodian to do the protection because at some point if it's if it's war you know if it's a war um, then if I've been attacked by another country you know where's the, where's what is where's my country's responsibility right. mm -hmm. to protect me from attacks from a, so I've mean, got to start sorting that out but I'd say building blocks you know who owns it and what obligations do we have who are those obligations? And you got to start. Right. We should start. And and I couldn't agree more. I mean, you can't you can't have this fifty state thing. It's, yeah, right. Do you want to as much as thoughts? I appreciate the initiatives that occur in states yeah. and it's, it's innovation. Right. You know, at some point. But should that be, should it be created? Because it makes you crazy. I mean, because you got fifty different. Obligations. What do you think? Do you think there's a dynamic that the 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 
laws are created by industry. For instance, your industry. Your industry captures massive amounts of data. And one of the questions is, you know, should you all come up with, you know, here's our rules-based engine around data yeah. usage and the underwriting process and, and you know, the, the, the risk assessment process. That's different than maybe what they're using. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, we're, um, so my business in particular, we're responding to um, what the impacts are of these attacks. And the rules are, I think, being set more in the courts mm -hmm. in terms of what's your obligation, you know, what, what damages are you being, uh, what, are, what damage are being imposed upon you. So it's, it's more of a, a development out of the court system necessarily than, than out of uh, legislation. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I was on a fantastic yeah. panel this morning. I mean, I listened to it. I wasn't on it mm -hmm. um, about this, where a woman from Zurich was talking about the how you know the insurance isn't set up to handle problems that are so systemic as cybersecurity. Right. And so we, we we you cannot get away from the cybersecurity component, and it's a global problem. And I, the the people who put together that panel was genius. They had someone from Swift there. Mm -hmm. So banking has been dealing with this kind of problem, and now tech has got to figure out mm -hmm. how to do this. Yeah. I want to come back to what you said about perishable mm -hmm. data. So again, under uh, old British data protection law, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being uncool, I can't remember, I'm pretty sure GDPR is similar. Mm -hmm. There was a maximum amount of time that you kept data legally, mm -hmm. and the British kept violating it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. um, but the, and there's a question about how long you needed it anyway and how to prove that. But how do you know that someone has actually deleted your data? And I, I really like the privacy metaphor. I want to come back to, I mean, the property metaphor. I want to come back to the property metaphor. Right. I think we're no longer ever going to, again, have a, a sort of a non, a, you know, privacy by, by, by anon, anonymity. Right. Yeah, okay. We're not going to have that. Mm -hmm. um, now it is like uh, your house. You know the police can get in your house. Your neighbors can get in your house. You know, smart squirrels can get into your house. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the military can get into your house. But you don't expect to find other people in your house. And when you do, it does happen, then you have recourses to law. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that Europe has said is that both at the national level and at the transnational level, there should be uh, regulatory agencies you can go to and appeal if you have a suspicion that someone's gotten into your house, mm -hmm. you know, if someone's been predicting you in ways that isn't appropriate. So right. I think um, most of the nations of Europe, I know the UK are, are setting up bodies to both proactively check and see if things are being done correctly, but also to be able to provide some kind of reactive service uh, when people yeah. uh, spot things like that. Yeah, I think, I think one of the prevailing themes we've been talking about here in Davos over this past few days is just all this this whole idea of trust. And you know, Edelman came up with a, a wonderful, you know, when you look at the trust index, it's the lowest ever in terms of governments and companies, but not for employers. Okay, <laughs> it's interesting. First time. Yeah, first time. So, so employers are looking, and people are saying, I have trust in my employer, but I don't have trust in, a com in companies or in governments. And when you start thinking about this whole dynamic of data and the use of data, the abuse of data, yeah. you know, who can you trust with your data? You know, where we have the challenge is how do we create a framework that, you know, restores trust beyond the employer that you work for, uh, where society says, I want to contribute my data. Okay, I get some benefits back. No, no question about it. But what's the right framework? And I think we're all struggling to find what that framework is. And you know, GDPR, I think, was kind of a good first step. It was a leading, leading step. But I'm not seeing any other frameworks being, being you know, advanced. And again, I kind of throw this to, to anyone out there before we go to questions in the audience. You know, what's the right way to think through this? And what's the right mechanism to, to, to start establishing and reestablishing trust in some of these establishments? I'm happy to jump in quickly uh, on, on two things. I, I wrote a blog post for the UN just a little while ago that said nobody should trust AI. And the idea was you shouldn't have to trust it because it should be transparent whether or not what's mm -hmm. happening. So trust is, uh, is, a, is a public good that we build up in a community where we know each other well enough that we don't need to know exactly what each other does. Mm -hmm. And with you know, the, the fourth industrial revolution and these sorts of things, we may not need that kind of trust so much if we can have you know, certification that the, the right kinds of things are happening and inspections and, account, and accounting. Mm -hmm. So that's one answer. Um, I, I'll, I'll drop should it. That, should that be done by the government? Should that be done by industry bodies? What's, what, what are your well, all's thoughts about that? Yeah, and, and how do you convince people? So I'm actually, oh, I know what I was gonna say. The other thing is I wouldn't trust the, the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. you, you should not have a device in your house that costs less than an upgrade is going to be worthwhile. No one's going to upgrade a light bulb that costs three pounds, mm -hmm. right? Or dollars or whatever, yeah. right? 
the, the, it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, these baby bots, do you know there was that thing that took down Netflix and everything? Yeah. It was baby bots. Those, th those are still infected. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to up, you know, the, the consumer won't do it, but the companies, it's not worth their money to write upgrades for these incredibly cheap products. So I think we should only be connecting to the internet expensive toys, not right, cheap toys. And maybe you could do some Bluetooth on the other stuff, yeah. but, yeah. Um, but you Talk need... Talk about the democratization, yeah. though, in that dynamic, yeah. though, so, yeah, yeah. little thoughts. Well, you know, I think that you know, I'm a big believer in transparency because it it does it does help because there's so many that are complicated and 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 any appearance of holding back or hiding always raises right. one's suspicions, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to 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 the extent you can be transparent. Now, I, and I went back to you know the algorithm thing. I mean, there's now there's intellectual property where it's you know I you know, I'm not going to tell you that. Certification's interesting, you know. I mean, how do you trust the company's books? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great question, right? So I said I did really well, you know. Well, we have lots of rules that build up right. um, as to what's appropriate, and then we do have those who oh, put an opinion down, right? mm -hmm. certified the accountants that say we've inspected these things. So. Because you, as an individual, can't do this. I mean, you're not going to go inspect everybody. You know, so you have to rely on somebody. Of course, I'm not sure I want to inspect. I want to insure them, yeah. but uh, <laughs> that's another story. But I think that maybe you might be might be onto something. That's not a bad idea. Let, let's do this before I turn to the audience. I want to talk a little bit about the future. You know, that the, the we can agree we are truly in the infancy of this whole data economy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're seeing infrastructure being built out, applications uh, being created, uh, and those applications and, you know, the data leading to, again, a whole series of technologies which are advancing in the AIs and MLs and, you know, you know, distributed ledger technology, et cetera, which will transform entire industries. And I'm going to ask you to just put your crystal balls on, you know, in, in front of you and just, just give me a sense or give us a sense, and, and I do want to start with you, about what you're seeing out there that you're most optimistic about in terms of how this data economy is going to be positive, not only for business, but for mankind and humanity? Well, you know, I, th I think that, um, you know, just at, at the core, the fact that, um, that whether it's countries or companies, um, can so much more easily reinvent the future or, th or dream up any new idea and actually deliver it quickly and test quickly and experiment and mm -hmm. figure out what people like and don't like is going to lead to so much progress on customer experiences across every dimension that exists today and that we just can't even fathom in right. the future. So I just think, you know, I often, we say this a lot um, uh, on our team, and I think sometimes people think it's, we're, we're saying it to be inspirational, but I, I really believe it, which is with all the incredible innovation uh, and the pace of innovation over the first 12 years that we've been working on AWS, I think it's going to be small compared to the next 12 years. I so, I, you know, that to me is very exciting. You know, I, I, there's some technologies that I think are, you know, very promising and, and exciting that, that I'm very optimistic about. And, you know, I think machine learning is a good example of one where I think that the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of concern about it and, and a lot of, um, um, you know, people being scared about it, and it's different, and there are risks to it, like any new technology, that have to be thought through, and, and people's privacy need to be thought through, and you can't impinge on people's uh, civil liberties, and all, you know, all that is important. But we've, you know, even though it's really in its infancy and being used uh, broadly, we already see all kinds of really good coming from it, you know. You're, you're, it's it's actually combating human trafficking, and it's finding helping missing kids find their parents at Disney, and and, and it's uh, um, changing the productivity of crops, and it's allowing uh, industrial companies to be able to predict when when a piece of equipment that's very expensive is going to fail before there's some right. kind of catastrophic event, and it's allowing people in retail um, stores to be able to get in and out much more. I mean, there's all these things that are really great for society. So I while I think that we have to you know, we have to think through all of the issues to protect people's privacy, and, and there probably should be um, uh, guidelines and, and perhaps regulation for governments. We should just make sure that we don't halt that progress and, and, and the benefits we can get in our society from doing so by, by overextending on the other side of that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, machine learning is a big one for me. I think also, um, you know, I'm very bullish on uh, what people are going to do at the edge, and I, I, we have this strong belief that 
10 to 20 years from now when people talk about having a hybrid of, um, of infrastructure, the, the on-premises part is not going to be on-premises data centers. Right. Um, it, it's going to be actually all these devices at the mm -hmm. edge. Mm -hmm. and, but there are a lot of really interesting hard problems with the edge. I mean, I, I think you were referring to when you know, Dyne took down a lot of the internet with a, you know, with a DDoS attack that came from the right. device. And, and, and so you have, you know, the security model is a little bit different. Um, how you think about getting the data into the cloud is different. Making sure that you have the right programming models so that builders can can design something and then decide what they want to take action in the cloud and, uh, and where they can't afford that latency of a round trip to the cloud and they want to take action right on the device itself and then being able to do predictions on the device. I think it's totally going to change customer experiences and yep. productivity and I think also robotics is another really interesting one yep. where uh, you know I think that um, a lot of tasks that we've always you know kind of come to uh, to see human beings doing it's not the greatest use of human beings. And I think you're going to find robotics enhancing all kinds of businesses. And I don't believe that means that all the jobs are going away. And, you know, I think with progress, you see all kinds of new jobs as well. But I think that's another area that we're, we're pretty bullish about, along with voice. You know, the other thing is, I mean, just think about when you first started being able to use apps on your phone. <laughs> I mean, it felt so revolutionary. And by the way, it is so much better than what we did before. But if you actually are able to instruct a device through your voice on doing something, it makes tapping on a phone in an app seem so circa 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that just um, the advent and, uh, and just the um, dramatic expansion of things that you're going to be able to do through voice technology is also very exciting. Well, one, one thing that, that, that you, as, as you mentioned and went through the narrative of all these, you know, what I'll call wonderful, innovative you know, dynamics is this whole idea of, okay, but are we ever going to have regulatory bodies or capabilities to, to provide the sort of protection so that we trust the institutions where we, where we lend this data? Should we govern the speed of innovation? You know, as a scientist, technologist, the answer is no. So how do we get the regulatory bodies to accelerate? You know, one of the questions, Joanna, I would ask you to kind of put it in context. It's a massive disruption that's occurring across the entire you know, economies and you know, the entire economy and the planet. How does this fit in context of other disruptions, right? And what do we need to do as a society to make sure that we have some faith and confidence in you know, the, the stewards of our, of our businesses and stewards of our data? I think there's, uh, there, you know, there's some pretty good historical precedents on this. Uh, let me say first, there's basically two problems. And so when you're saying what AI can do to help us, right? There's basically two problems any species has. It's sustainability and inequality. Okay. Right? Sustainability is how big is the pie? You know, how, how much public goods can you put together? How many people can you have using it? And then, and then inequality is how do you divide it up? And we know that you don't necessarily want to give exactly the same size to everybody. You want to have uh, you know, incentives, incentives and things like that. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if it gets too distorted, then you start getting people uh, uh, feeling that they're falling behind, and then they get defensive, and you, you get fear, and you get uh, parochialism. And you see these kinds of problems. And so, of course, um, I think that when you have a new technology, and now this is work I'm doing actually with political economists. So this, this hasn't been published yet, but it is with reputable political economists. Uh, when you have new technology, that might uh, be inclined to increase inequality just because you can have, if the technology reduces the cost of distance, then you can have a smaller number of winners, mm -hmm. and you just definitionally wind up with inequality. These people who got there first, it right. wasn't you know it wasn't right. unfair. It just they they were great, mm -hmm. um, but then you have all these power problems, and so we look like the beginning of World War One right now mm -hmm. um, in it's terms exactly. of the, a lot of the international uh, dynamics. Right. That so we exactly. need to reinnovate governance, and like I was talking about, coming up with really different uh, models. Mm -hmm. Maybe the transnational tech companies shouldn't be in one nation. Maybe we should be bartering, or, or not bartering, setting up treaties with them right. about these are the, the standards you have to do. I think there'll be more trust when there's more uh, trustworthy behavior expressed. People mm -hmm. are afraid because, you know, we are in a hard situation. People don't want to believe the news because climate change is real and they don't want to know that. Yeah. They don't want to know it's only going one direction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's uh, serious problems we need to solve and I do think AI and data are some of the ways we can solve them, but we got to solve the political problems first and there's some people trying to disrupt this and trying to maintain right. uh, corruption and that's some of the problems we're dealing yeah. with. Let's, let's go to the audience for, for questions. Any questions we can field? One front row left. Could 
be curious if you or one of the panelists could address um, the one topic that didn't come up today or one of them, which is the advent of 5G mm -hmm. and processing speeds 10 times low latency and I think as the carriers describe it, real-time data. Right. So we're talking today about data that's somewhat delayed. Yeah. Just right. curious how you guys are going to handle that. Yeah. Anyway, you want to take any of you? I mean, I'll, I'll give a short answer. I mean, we, we work with uh, um, all of the telco companies, and, and they're understandably um, very excited and, and focused on 5G. And, and uh, I think that uh, it, it provides the capability for, again, customer experiences that you can't really have today. Um, you know, just the speed of connectivity and the interactiveness of it and, uh, and, a, and a whole new set of applications that people just haven't really been able to imagine. I mean, I think there are some existing industries, gaming is a good example of that, that is, you know, really excited about being able to have that speed and then, you know, being able to actually um, uh, have that connectivity to all these satellite bases. And, but they are going to be, um, they're going to be capabilities and, and, and applications that we never dreamed of because the latency, you just, you couldn't do it on a device itself and the latency back to something like a cloud or a data center was just too long that, that just never existed that's going to become commonplace and, and that's 5G. There's going to be something after 5G too. Mm -hmm. Brian and Joanna. Well, I, I was going to say that, you know, look at that, you know, the speed and power, it's wonderful and, you know, the, the interconnectedness is even more and there's applications that we can't even dream of. And that scares me to death as a guy taking the risk. As I'm just going to tell you, this is wonderful. This is great, you know. Yeah. Like, tears coming down my eyes. Yeah. Uh, but, I, I, but you yeah. can't, you know, but you have to, you got to keep up. You have to keep up. Yeah. 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 No, I, I was going to say uh, pretty similar that, that um, from theoretical biology perspective, when you have better communication, then you have a faster ability to find people that you can coalition with, that you, that you can uh, figure out new ways again to create public goods. And you start acting more as groups. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think what some of the fractionation that we're seeing is the fact that it's so fast that you can find new coalitions and things. So right. I think all the governance issues we're seeing now right. are only going to be accelerated. And by it actually issues. gets to accelerate the ecosystem dynamics, right? I, right. I know we, you know, with our 60 plus portfolio companies, I see one of my CEOs from TIPCO. I mean, the real time innovative capacity that they have, if you have, you know, shorter latency is, is quite dramatic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, the, the innovative right. dynamic. Uh, uh, in engaging with customers and then cre engaging entire ecosystems and putting in things like, you know, distributed ledger technologies that now can, you know, group in not right. tens of customers but hundreds and thousands of, of potential customers in your ecosystem. I think that's some of the advantages that we're seeing in, in looking at and evaluating. Joanna? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just that it's not, I, didn't, I, I was a little too negative. There's, it means there's new ways to hack and new, and new uh, changes of identity, but at the same time, maybe we can get coalitions going at the right level. We are just going to have to figure out how to handle these problems with cybersecurity and transnational right. uh, redistribution from the transnational companies and things like that. And, and maybe we'll come to those solutions. I think it's an open question. I think we have to work hard. I think we are sort of in the middle of World War III. It's a cyber war. Yeah, and, I agree. And so we could go either way. Yeah, and plus we have this computing power we now can get for $10 a month after this session. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> Let's actually, uh, we have another question here. Thank you. Um, my name is Mariam Robinson. I'm from Jamaica, CEO of a bank there. And my question, as we talk a lot about inclusive growth and we move towards the fourth industrial revolution and the massive disruption that's taking place, I'm trying to get a sense from the panel. Um, how do you see this affecting small, kind of poorer economies? as we really work to ensure we don't leave persons behind. Who's going to govern? Who's going to regulate this innovation and massive disruption that's taking place? I can, I can do uh, a couple quick takes on that. So uh, we, uh, this came up earlier, and we didn't quite go there. The, um, since we've had this technology, globally, inequality has actually been dropping. Mm -hmm. So there's been a massive reduction of the proportion and the number of people that are in extreme poverty. And there's, uh, because you can get information out, people are, are harder to rip off. You know, there is more fair trade. There are people getting know what the right prices are. So, um, so a lot of the story has been positive, but then some people, uh, I, I've been hearing even here, that, um, that, yeah, but then you're able to kind of create a ceiling. And then we see this gr you know, grotesquely rising inequality in, in the OECD, right? So, um, and of course, so there are, again, people trying to put together new, interesting uh, transnational coalitions. Um, I know that India has said they've specifically chosen their area of AI as supporting the rest of the world. 
They want, they want to be looking at applications that will help all the people that the big players are forgetting, right? And I think there are, um, Japan is trying to lead, um, partly because they, do, they don't see how they can make the investments that American companies and, and Chinese government have made. Um, but, they, but they're doing it in a very positive way. They've apparently, uh, I just heard this at my previous meeting, so I'm not sure what this means entirely, but they've so somehow become an extension of the GDPR. They've signed up to that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think, again, they would like to, to lead a lot of countries into having a, a very inclusive. So there are a lot of champions and a lot of, don't forget, one of the wonderful things is this whole AI for good kind of movement. A lot of, as we, as we fight for talent, and then you have especially millennials and people, but I think all of us, who doesn't want to do good with their lives, right? Yep. And so there's a lot of people that when you bring these questions to the table and remind people because of their implicit biases were to forget them, they go, wait, I want to, be, I want to work on that. It, so, it is interesting. So you're helping. I'll dovetail on that. You know, we, we have the great fortune of working with a number of sovereign wealth funds uh, who actually are embracing a number of our portfolio companies and say, listen, we want to take in, in education and agriculture and other areas, we want to take certain of these solutions and actually put them in our, in our neighboring countries to actually improve the quality and condition. Uh, you know, food, food stability, uh, transparency, education, educational uplift opportunities, identification of, of you know, individuals who can actually can continue to propel their societies forward. To me, that's quite encouraging. You know, for, for, for many years, you know, you think about, oh, they're focused only on the amount of capital that they can create and, and capture, et cetera. But I am seeing an outreach on their side, and fortunately, we were able to respond uh, with actually real tools, systems, and solutions that are leveraging current technologies and future, the AI technologies of how do you become predictive in farming and how do you aid the, the farmer there? What's actually growing well today for your neighbor that you need to change in what you're doing so you can actually enhance your yields and you know, decrease your losses, those sort of things, take your crop to a better place to actually sell it at a, at a different price that may change in complete condition, micro loans, micro lending, all those sort of dynamics which are mobile enabled you know, latency, you know, defined in some respect, I think will continue to create the, the, the overall up, uplift so long as you have those people who are focused on it. But again, yeah. you know, oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm just, I was, you want to finish, please. Uh, let me, just within the agriculture, I just saw a fantastic new paper that, I mean, the paper is an out event, I just saw it presented by uh, Salon Barakan and uh, Karen Levy at Cornell, mm -hmm. that Great when school, you do that stuff, yeah, well, <laughs> that, that, um, when you do all that, you are taking away part of the way that farmers and farming communities were able to rent, rent, mm -hmm. you know, right. maintain, maintain yes, their integrity. Well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, a concern that then all the power winds up somewhere else again in, you know, say Monsanto or something, mm -hmm. and that the communities no longer had their specialist knowledge, which was the way they were able to maintain their household income. Yeah, right. So again, we've got to solve some other redistribution Oh, there's, there's always the dynamic, right? The, the, yeah. the lurching yeah. of it. Brian? Oh, AIG and a... a six or seven other insurance companies got together, created something called Blue Marble to get to provide micro insurance. And the idea was we knew individually we couldn't create anything, but we thought collectively we could, you know, provide, provide better solutions to create markets and do what we do, which is basically social good anyway. What I was surprised about was I, I was right and wrong. I was right that we couldn't do it alone as, as seven insurance companies. We need each other. We needed a bigger ecosystem and people came from all over the place so whether it's satellite imagers or it's the seed manufacturers or it's people who provide who develop technology that can that can monitor health plant all come because they all want to, for different reasons to do the same thing mm -hmm. and so we're providing insurance to micro farmers in Zimbabwe you know which and for us there's the benefit of reverse engineering because if we if we can solve the ability to deliver a product that's so small in its, you know, in its size right. and do it economically, we, get, we reap the benefits. We get the benefits of technology. So it's been a very interesting reverse kind of process for me. So I, I, I think I'm with you. I think there's, there's a general feeling of wanting to do good and, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of outreach there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for most countries, you, you know, I think the, the, there's an education side to this thing. It's, right. it's, it's your own. Uh, all our populations have to be able to deal with this right. new Andy, world. I'll just add one quick thing just to your question. Uh, I think that, you know, if the, a lot of times when people talk about what the cloud actually is, they really talk about it as democratization of technology. And so I think it's, it's you know, when you think about um, 
smaller countries having access to the same capabilities and, and helping solve some of the inequalities that may exist based on where you are, I think it's a great playing field leveler. You know, and, and we have we have customers in 192 countries, even though we only have infrastructure and in, you know, probably uh, about 20 of them, and it's just because they have access, because it's all through the cloud and through APIs, they have access to that technology, and, and not just the infrastructure, but actually the software, you know, where they all have to pay for what they use, and so it, it just, it's kind of amazing how many entrepreneurs and how many startups have gotten going and that have you know global end users from all kinds of countries that really just wasn't possible before. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting prospect at four dollars and fifty cents a month for yeah. sure. <laughs> I have time for one more down. question. Yeah. So in the data ownership space, thank you. Hi, Denise Bradley Tyson. In the data ownership space, where does facial recognition factor into this? Mm -hmm. In terms of who owns. Right, your face, oh, your image. Well, that, is this my face or not? Right. Yeah. That goes back to the face. personal data again, but, but there's still, there's so many other issues about it. It isn't only about who owns your face, but it's also about um, do, the, do the companies who are producing face recognition software take as much care with all the, the communities because uh, do they train the models and make sure that we're in more diverse uh, communities uh, that, they, that they're actually able to provide a service? Again, there's been a lot of panels here. Um, this is one of the things you know, that Microsoft brought, you know, they went out with a blog and said, we want to be regulated. Now you can see that as kind of being like, okay, we can't solve this problem, we're going to throw it over the, <laughs> yeah. the wall. But in a way, that's what government is for. The government, you know, if we can keep it, you know, to, uh, control on the corruption and those kinds of things, the whole point of government is that it's how we coordinate these kinds of actions yeah. between us. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I, and certainly I, the Obama administration yeah. was worried about that. I'm sorry, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I live in Bermuda. And um, so uh, Michael Douglas is from Bermuda. His mom is Bermudian. Mm -hmm. And he would tell me he loves to come to Bermuda because there's no paparazzi. So you think that's his face, right? This is, he, you know, I mean, this is part of who he is. Yeah. And how does he prevent publication of, of his face? Yeah, this mm -hmm. is fundamental. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, well, because in Bermuda, we, you can't come in and do work unless you have a work permit. And so if it wasn't taken by a professional photographer in Bermuda, he could stop it from being published. So I don't think it's much different than that. I mean, I think there is, for us, you know, as celebrities, I'm not one, but I mean, you know, have been living this. And I think we, we can draw some analogies that somehow that's not right. You know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't publish my, not, not without my right. Agre right. agreement. Right. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, you know, I think that um, if you look at how facial recognition technology works, um, at least, you know, for service providers who have services like that, um, the, uh, the way it works is that the company, whoever are the customers of these service providers or the cloud providers bring the, face, the faces that they're going to try and do some kind of matching against. And, uh, you know, I think that you have to have different levels of sensitivity and responsibility depending on what you're doing. So now, if you're using facial recognition um, and, and as a company you know, or a customer of a, of a service provider, you bring a bunch of faces and you're, you're trying to do celebrity identification, you should be thoughtful about it, but there's a different risk in just trusting the, the facial recognition technology than if you're going to use the facial recognition technology to do something that involves law enforcement. And, you know, there, you know, I think your conf you know, every one of these services provides a confidence level on, on kind of what the prediction is. And your confidence level when you're thinking about doing something that, that is law enforcement related where you might impact somebody's civil liberty, that needs to be, in, in our opinion, over three, you know, 99.9 percent to right. even take the recommendation seriously. Mm -hmm. And then it only should be used as one input in a human decision. And when you're talking about individuals' liberties, you got to make sure right. that you know the, the power of facial recognition technology is it can take a, a problem set from hundreds of thousands of pop possibilities down to a, a much smaller amount. But then. You take that input, and then along with human judgment and other artifacts, you kind of figure out what the decision is. You can't just take it, you know, just take the technology and then act on it. And so, you know, I, I think that there's a presumption that people are going to be irresponsible in different industry segments or, or law enforcement segments with the data. And we have, so far, we haven't had, you know, any reported cases of that. But you can imagine how it could exist. 
And so I think it's it's smart to have a set of policies around what acceptable uses are. We we have, you know, a set of policies, and if people break those, they're not allowed to use ours. But I think one of the reasons why a number of us um, in industry are suggesting that the government provide guidelines is just I think that it, it will just make people feel more secure and more safe about how they're being used if there are some principles or guidelines or even regulations so that you know people understand that everybody's operating under the same principles. Okay, quick lightning round. Best thing about WEF 2019? Uh, did I just start? No. <laughs> oh, anyone wants to go? Uh, uh, the people you meet, of course. All right. Yeah, I would just say uh, it's really an honor to be around this number of smart leaders and, and have them all in one place, and you just feel like you never have enough time to see them all. And, and, you're here. and, and tackling a very interesting problem. Yeah. You yeah. know? And answer is closing ceremony, Sphinx organization, Sphinx virtually see playing. So you guys okay. go make sure you, you see the, that group. They're fantastic young people from America playing some beautiful music. So anyway, thank you all panelists thank for you. this wonderful thank and rousing. Thank you. Thank you.